Hi, I'm Javis Lewis, and in this video I'm going to show you how to combine a Dash Studio render onto an existing background in Photoshop. So imagine you render a character and you've taken a picture with your camera and you want to combine the two so it makes it appear as if the 3D character stands in front of what you've taken a picture of. And my picture is going to look something like this. So I've, I went out to the beach and took a picture of the newest lifeguard tower here in my neighborhood. And then I've rendered the 3D Universe crab in 3D Lite. And I've mounted, I've kind of mixed them together. And there's a, quite a few techniques that we'll learn here. And the first thing that you'll notice is that the crab casts a shadow onto the sand, or it appears to do that. So for that we'll create a shadow catcher in Dash Studio and I'll explain to you what that is later. And also there's a few tricks here in Photoshop that make the picture appear to be taken with depth of field but that's not the case. I've taken it on my mobile phone and that means usually everything is pretty much in focus and there's no um, there's no depth of field there. But it looks much more realistic if there was depth of field and I'm going to show you how to do that as well in Photoshop. And then we're going to learn about uh, smart objects. That means it's, it's a technique in Photoshop that lets you make amendments to your picture later. So it's about all about non-destructive editing. So um, in Photoshop, if I'd if I'd create a blur, then the picture would be blurred for forever. But if I wanted to have less or more blur later, then a smart object will come in handy. So that's what we're going to be doing today in this video. And um, let's just jump right into Dash Studio and begin. Um, this is an empty scene. I'm using Dash Studio 4.9 and I'm going to start by getting my character in. So in my case I'm going to use that crab. So I'll head over to Smart Content and go to my Figure section. And the very first one is the 3D Universe Toon Crab. But it'll work with any character, animals, uh, people, anything you have available. So let's double click him to get him into the scene. There he is. And let's just, you know, not do that because that's kind of for later here. Dash Studio is getting very excited, wants to get ahead of things. So let's frame him up a little bit. And also give him a nice pose. So perhaps something like a. Yeah, maybe something like this. That's cool. He's, and then we turn him so that he looks at the camera, as if he's waving at the camera. Make him a bit bigger. Whoops. Yeah, something like that, perhaps. Cool. That's nice. Do a quick test render. Whoa, and we'll see he's all black, so that means he we don't have any lights in our scene. I'm using 3D Light, by the way. I'm not using iRay because um, 3D Light, well, he's, the Toon Crab is set up to be a 3D Light object, so rather than converting him, I'll just leave him as the creator has intended, and I'm just going to uh, put a few lights into the scene. I'm not going to create those myself to speed up the project here. Um, head over to my lights. So this is on the smart content tab here. Make sure this box is not ticked. Filter by content. And find something that I like here. Predatron's Essential Lights and Skies. They're 3D light lights and they look really nice. It's just a one-click solution to great lighting in 3D light. Perhaps the Cumulus IDL because the picture I'm going to use later is going to look um, a little bit overcast. In fact, let me show you what we're going to combine him onto. That you well, actually, you've seen it in the you've seen it in the in the beginning. So yeah, you're kind of familiar with the picture already. So um, there's there's always two types here. There's the, the cumulus cloud and cumulus IDL. IDL takes a little bit longer to render, so we'll just use cumulus cloud. And that comes in with a background here with a sky dome but we don't really need that so I'm gonna head over to my scene tab and just switch off the sky dome. Everything else is still in here so if you need to adjust the brightness of the lights uh, that's the sunlight, the specular and the uber environment. But hey, that's for another time. I'm just gonna make sure that that uh, background here is not gonna show. Well let's do another quick test render see what happens. And there's the crab in bright sunlight now. That's nice. 
But the trouble is that he's not casting a shadow right now. So everything that's a checkerboard in the background here is transparent. And everything that is picture content like the crab and uh, that's, that is um, well, picture content. So if we save that as a PNG file, then this transparency channel gets saved as well. And we can replace everything that is checkerboard with something else in Photoshop. But of course, the trouble is, um, that now the crab doesn't cast a shadow. So if we combine that onto a picture, it doesn't look very realistic. And you could go ahead and kind of um, draw the shadow in Photoshop with a very soft brush. But there's an easier way to do that if you're using a 3D render. And that's using a technique called the shadow catcher. And that is something where if we were to add an object into our scene, such as a plane, then the crab would cast a shadow on it. In fact, let me show you uh, what I mean. Head over to Create, Primitive. And here we can create lots of primitives. And the one we want is a plane. That's just a 2D object. And give it a nice large size of 50 meters I've given it. And if you hit Accept, then this is our plane here. In fact, in our scene tab, let me close everything else so that we have the Toon Crab, the Sky Dome, and the Plane. So this is just the light, this is our Toon Crab, and this is the Plane. And if I render this image now, the Crab actually stands on this Plane and does cast a shadow on the Plane. And this is really what we want to have in our combined photos. So we want, we want the Crab to appear to throw a shadow onto the, onto the beach there. And uh, the trouble now is that with the plane in the picture, only half of the picture is transparent. So we can see that this part here is still transparent. So if we do, if we put our picture um, behind that in Photoshop, it would show up here. But where the plane is, that would not show up. So this is all solid um, image content here. So what we need is some technique that only renders the shadow uh, and the plane where the shadow is, but nothing else. So wherever the plane is, we don't want to see it unless it has a shadow. And this is, this technique is called a shadow catcher. And that is just something that the 3D light render engine does. It is also possible to do that in iRay. Perhaps I'll show you that in another video, but for now we'll stick with the 3D light here. And in order to plug this shadow catcher node in, it's just one, one node, we need to use the shader mixer. The shader mixer is a tab. I've got it docked here already, shader mixer. But if this tab isn't showing anywhere in your workspace, you can head over to Window, Panes, and then you head over to Shader Mixer down here. And then it'll come up and you can dock it anywhere in your workspace. Mine is docked already, so I'm just going to switch to it. And this is a node setup that represents a shader in a way slightly different to the Surfaces tab. In fact, speaking of the Surfaces tab, we need that one as well to select what shader we want to actually affect. So um, head over to the Surfaces tab here as well. I've got that open as well, but same thing if you haven't got it. It's, it's again, it's under Window Panes and Surfaces. Now, these two representations are more or less the same. It's just a, it's a different way of visualizing a shader or the surface properties of an object. And in order, this is kind of just a, just a default material that's come in um, that is currently the same as what's on the plane because if you create a primitive, it always comes with this gray white default material. And uh, this is also what the shader mixer usually comes up with if you say file new shader. So if you head over to File New inside the Shader Mixer, it'll create this shader, which is just a white default material, much like the one that we saw here in our viewport in the, uh, on the plane. In fact, so that I can have my Shader Mixer open and see my render at the same time, I'm going to switch from Scene over to the Aux viewport here, making sure my plane is selected because that has the shader on it that I want to affect. Head over to um, Orcs Viewport, and um, what's happening here? Oh, there we go. There he is. Right. Let's see what happens if I were to, if I'm going to select my plane over here. Make sure this is selected in the Surfaces tab. You can change the properties of your object here. So if I were to uh, change something like uh, the color of my plane, it it turns green. But 
it hasn't quite reflected that in here. So in order for, for this shader to actually appear as nodes in here, I'd have to make sure this is selected, first of all, the object, and then head over to File, Import from Scene. And it asks me what you want to import here, material, camera, or lights. I want to import my material, hit Accept, and then this is going to import whatever was on my object so usually if you if you import a, a shade of a, of a person it's going to be very complex only works 50 percent of the time it's a feature because it's so cool and free it, it doesn't work with every shader so you can't import every shader into the shader mixer do not ask me why it's just you know it's just the way it works and we can see that the green is reflected here. If I head over to my diffuse color, there's some kind of green in here. Whereas the previous one, this is the other shader here that we had under diffuse color, that is still white. Just wanted to show you the relation. This does not automatically update. You have to import this. And in our case, we, uh, we do very much want this to be uh, white. So let me just set that back to white and the, so so now I've made a change here in this material in the shader mixer to get that over to my material in the scene I have to hit apply and now this is white again and no longer green and the uh, surfaces tab has also changed that's just a quick introduction of this is how basically the shader mixer works it's a very complex topic I'm not going to go into any more details here the only thing that we want to do is plug in this shadow catcher node here and we can do that we've got a material set up here now we can do that by adding a new brick to this setup and that's under here that's under bricks uh, make sure functions is uh, open and then under shadows there's something called the shadow catcher and we get that into here just by uh, left clicking and dragging this over until this little plus icon appears here. Pop that in here. You can also reposition that anywhere else. And uh, this node here has a color output. So the C is for color. And we want to make sure we put that into the opacity of our uh, material here. And we do that by left clicking and dragging from here. And then it builds that little cable here and we just plug that right in to opacity color. Now we have one connection here. We've got another couple of connections here that were already there. And again, this is not uh, showing up here right now because I need to hit apply to make sure that goes onto my, um, onto my object. Now I still don't see anything changing here in the scene, but that's because the scene isn't rendered. So the shadow catcher will only show up if you render it, if we render that scene. And uh, we can either just uh, hit Command R, Control R, and uh, do a little preview render here. And that will do that. And we can see there's no more plane, but there is a shadow that that is underneath the crap. It doesn't look particularly great at the moment, but we'll tweak that in a second. If you're working with the with the shader mixer or with any other aspect of Das Studio and you need to see the rendered result, then rather than creating a render every time to get a preview, you can also use the um, the interactive preview render in the AUX viewport in 3D Light. It's a little bit different in iRay where you have where you can basically um, just change this to iRay and then you have a rendered viewport at all times. With 3D Light, it's slightly different. You have uh, you it only works in the AUX viewport. In this little context menu, you can have start and stop IPR render. You can even show the IPR toolbar, that's this little thing, and then you have the start and stop buttons right here. So if you start that, then a reduced render is being created in that little window here. So that lets you keep an eye on what the final render would look like without having to wait for the whole render to complete. Now, the, what I'm uh, what I'm not happy about here is that the shadow seems to be cast on a completely white surface, and in fact, that's that's the case. That is true. But our beach picture isn't going to be completely white. It's more like a more like a dark kind of color. So, in order to make the shadow a little bit darker and uh, look like a proper shadow that would be cast in daylight onto a darkish or medium color object, we can do two things here. On one hand, we can um, take down the diffuse color, and the other is we can take down the specular color. So specular is already a medium gray. That's a good start. I think we're going to make that a black. And the diffuse color, let's take that down 
not to not to total black but to like a darkish gray and if we do that again do remember we have to hit the apply button to make that transfer over to the material that studio realizes that and renders as a new um, image as it would appear in the final render so this doesn't look so bad i think i'm going to go with that and, and kick off let me switch that uh, preview render off and render this thing in full there we go that's our crab just with the shadow underneath it and everything else is transparent so this should this should give us some good results in Photoshop. Good stuff. Let's save it on our desktop. Call it crab. Oh yeah, make sure this is saved as a PNG file. Otherwise the transparency in a JPEG file or in a bitmap file is not going to be saved. The TIFF file, I believe, does save it. I hardly use TIFF these days, but PNG will definitely save the transparent color channel here so that you have the transparency in Photoshop. In fact, let's jump over to Photoshop. And on my desktop, I've got these two pictures here, crab and beach. So I'm going to open both of them. There he is. That's my crab with the shadow. I suppose we could crank up the render settings a little bit to get rid of those um, of those tiny artifacts here. I may not do that for this demo, just uh, perhaps I'll show you where that is. So this has to do with the shading rate. If you ever head over to render settings, I'm using the defaults here um, under sampling. The, the pixel samples and the shadow samples and if you crank those up then your render will take a little bit longer but those little artifacts that i've just seen um these little grainy bits around the shadow they will disappear i will leave that for now because it's just a it's just a demo now notice that my beach picture here has a very different aspect ratio than my crab picture so i can make a decision if I either want to take my crab into the beach picture or put the beach picture into the crab picture. So um, it's a tricky one. Perhaps I'll just stick with the beach picture here and copy the crab into it. And you can either do that by selecting this layer and um, selecting uh, Command or Control A and then Command or Control Copy to copy everything. But there's an easier way to do that just by um, uh, clicking on right clicking on the layer and saying duplicate layer you get the same menu if you head over to layer and duplicate layer and then you can uh, ask photoshop where you would like that to be copied to either to new document to the same document or to different document that's already open which in our case is beach so let's do that and now the crab has been copied over to my beach picture which is funky so here he is and with the move tool I can now put him in position. I don't think I want the whole picture. I think I want my crab to be down here and perhaps be a little bit smaller. And um, let me accept that and use my crop tool here to change the whoops to um, change what's what's being shown there on my on my picture. Yeah, perhaps just something like this. I think that's that's really all I want to see. I don't want to see the whole uh, picture. Yes, I think this is what I want. And again, if the crab's not in position, you can use this little icon here, the move tool. It's a control that the shortcut is V for that. And then you can move your crab around. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll move him here as if I've just caught him there by the beach running around. So far, so good. I think I will save my document for now. Each PSD on the desktop is fine, so I'll save all the layers here. And um, so now the, we have the we have the shadow underneath the crab that looks much more realistic, as if you wouldn't have a shadow. Um, but the background still does not have any depth of field right now. So let's uh, work on that next. The, uh, there is a way to create a blurring in the uh, in in a layer by just selecting the layer and heading over to Filter Blur. And then Gaussian Blur should do the trick. Well, that's maybe a bit too much here. But uh, we can blur the picture like this. 
But again, this wouldn't be very realistic because everything is blurred. And in a in a proper depth of field setup, the beginning of the of, of the depth of field would be in focus, and then the image would gradually become out of focus here. And uh, that's that's just not the case if we just blur the background. So what we really need, and we cancel out of this, is we need two versions of our of our picture. We need one that is blurred and one that is not blurred, and then we're going to put a layer mask in that with the gradient that uh, goes from white to black or from black to white, where black is not affecting the image behind it and white is uh, using the, the top layer of the image. It's kind of a kind of difficult to explain, I'll, but I'll show you what I mean. Let's duplicate that layer first by holding down the Alt or Option key on that layer and then left click and drag. That will duplicate a layer, or you can just use the um, context menu that I've shown you before with the right click, duplicate layer, that'll do the same thing. Now one of these images needs to be blurred. In fact, let me um, uh, name those. I'll just call this one background, or also spelled correctly, background, there we go. And this one, uh, perhaps I'll just call blurred. So that I know which one's which. And this one, while I'm at it, is called my crap. There we go. Perfect. Uh, now the blurred uh, picture is currently not blurred, and I will do that with with um, whatever I've shown you before, the filter and uh, blur, Gaussian blur. But before I do that, I'm going to turn my layer into a smart object, and that is done by heading over to Layer, Smart Objects, Convert to Smart Object. And when you do that, there's this little icon that appears on the on the layer thumbnail there. And I'm doing that because if I now apply a filter, any filter really, blur, Gaussian blur, and I go over the top, say I'm, I'm blurring it so much that I can't even see my, my background anymore, I now get this layer structure here. And that means I can now non-destructively go back to the blur effect and say, hey, 60 was a bit much. Perhaps I'll try five instead. And then accept that. So now Photoshop will, every time I go into that, will will um, dynamically create that blur rather than burn it into the layer. So that's much better for what we're doing here. Because this may be too much blur, I can't quite tell yet. I really need to see that that gradient there before I make a, an educated decision on that. So that's what smart objects do. And you can use them for many things in Photoshop. They're a very good feature, very funky. Now really what I want to do is mix the top layer that's blurred with the bottom one that's not blurred. And I don't want to do that with, a, with an abrupt line here. I want to do that with a gradual kind of a gradient from here to there, something like that. And we can do that by adding a layer mask to the blurred layer. So make sure this little picture is selected, not this thing, not this, it must be this one. And head over to the bottom here where it has this little um, rectangular thing with a hole in here. It's kind of the, the symbol for a layer mask. So click that and then Photoshop will put another white thing next to that, next to that uh, layer thumbnail that's affected. And also notice what happens here that you can either click that first picture and then the, the, the thumbnail of the layer has an outline or you can click on the layer mask. Nothing appears to happen in the in the image itself. But it's important where you're going to apply that gradient. If you apply the gradient here, um, then it'll uh, be added to the picture, which is not what we want. Whereas when we click this thing, then it'll be added to the layer mask. And one other thing, if you Alt or Option click onto the layer mask, then you see the layer mask. So you no longer see the picture, you now see just the layer mask. And I will leave that here for now because I'll show you what this gradient thing that I keep talking about is going to do. So first of all, we're going to find our gradient tool underneath the paint bucket. Uh, this thing has about has three functions. So if you left click and um, hold onto it, you see the whoops, <laughs> you see the gradient tool, the bucket tool, and the 3D material drop tool. So in our case, we need the gradient tool. So if you don't see this icon in your tools palette, just uh, hold click on the paint bucket tool and it'll it'll show up there.
So with it selected, make sure that your colors here are set to black and white. So just uh, click this thing if that's not the case. The little black and white icon up here that will uh, turn these colors into black and white. And if you now hover over the uh, over your document with the layer mask still selected, you can drag a line, say from here to there. And it starts with the first color, which is white in our case, and it ends with the second color, which is black in our case. So as soon as you let go of the mouse, that's your gradient. So it goes from one color to the next. And if we drag a long line, like from here to there, then this gradient is going to be very soft. Everything above where you clicked will stay the same color, and everywhere below where you let go will also stay the same color, i.e. black in this case. So we can either do this, we can even drag outside the document if we wanted for, for a really soft gradient, or have a much shorter one for a much sharper gradient. And they're not accumulative, it's every time you do this it'll be, it'll be a new gradient. And that's not much fun if we don't actually see our picture, so we don't really know uh, where the gradient needs to be here. Um, but a gradient is now going to be applied on the layer mask. And if we select our thumbnail again on the top here, um, then Photoshop will show us the image again. And we can see the effect that our layer mask is having. So this is in fact blurred, and this is not blurred down here. It's just a matter of picking out where we'd like our gradient to happen. So in order to do that is we can draw the same gradient um, again by clicking on the layer mask, this time just clicking, not alt-clicking. So alt-clicking will show the layer mask, just clicking will just draw on the layer mask. And with our gradient tool still selected, we can maybe draw a gradient from here to about here. How's that going to look? Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe a bit shorter like I had it before. It's kind of nice. Yeah, something like that. It's a bit of a trial and error thing. Yeah, so I definitely like the crab to be in focus. So I want my gradient to finish about here and start, yeah, maybe about there, maybe about where the horizon is, perhaps something like that. Oh, slightly, maybe slightly lower. So from here to about there. Yeah, I think I'm happy with that. But what I'm not happy with is that the this part on the bottom here, the, the crisp picture, that's that's nice, but the blurred picture is maybe a little bit too blurred for my liking. So I can I can see that there's something artificial going on here where the lifeguard tower is. It doesn't look quite natural. And I think it's not my gradient that does that. I think it's just the amount of blur that we're having here is just a bit too strong. So um, I could try a, a larger gradient from here to there. No, that just looks, you know, that just looks, that looks just as if I've got butter on my lens. This is not really what I want. So from, from here to there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that. And what I'm going to change is the actual amount of Gaussian blur I have on, on my picture here. And the great thing about the smart objects is now I can do that. So I can just double click on Gaussian blur again and say, okay, four, five was too much. Let's try four. Looking better. Perhaps that's even still too much. Perhaps three. Or two even, 2.5, something like that. That looks much more natural. Maybe I'll leave it at 2.5 or maybe three, well, not 23, maybe three. Yeah, 2.5. 2.5 it is, perfect. Yeah, I think that looks much more realistic. But there's still things we can improve on that picture. So a couple of things spring to mind. Um, and uh, one is that perhaps the blurred out part of my picture now looks very well kind of perfect if i had taken this with a film camera perhaps i would even though the picture is blurred i would probably still see some kind of film noise or some kind of film grain and uh, that's an easy fix since this layer is already a smart layer i'm going to create another filter here and over to filter noise and add a bit of noise not too much, so maybe, you know, that's too much. Two was too much, maybe just one. And that gives it that little bit of extra imperfection here. I think that is exactly what I want. That that makes this look a little bit more natural, as if this was actually um, a depth of field caused by a camera rather than by artificiality here.
Yeah, let's do that. Just 1% is fine. Try it out, 2, 3, depending on how big your picture is. These uh, percentage values, they, they work on, on how big the actual image is. So if you're using your 40 megapixel image, 1% really isn't going to make much of a difference. So try it out. I'm just going to click OK. And you can see that even Add Noise now has its own item down here in the layer structure. So if I wanted to ever change that, I'll just have to double click that. And thanks to the smart objects, uh, I can I can now change this. OK, that's one more step into the realm of realism. Another thing that I can see here is that the crab was rendered perhaps a little bit too bright. If I compare this to the background, it was a bit of an overcast afternoon and the crab has very white shiny eyes. I mean, it's, you know, it, it makes it, it makes it look okay, but I think he's just a little bit too bright. So uh, there's, there's two ways of dealing with that. I can either head over back into Das Studio and take down the light a little bit so that the, that the light in his eyes is a little bit, um, less. But that's kind of trial and error, um, and it takes more render time. There's an easier way to do this right within Photoshop, and that is by adding above the crab, adding an adjustment layer. Um, and we can do that with this little circle down here in the layers palette, the black and white circle. If you click that, then uh, we can perhaps add an exposure filter. Brightness and contrast will probably do the trick too, but I think if we use exposure, then we bring back a little bit of detail in the white of his eye. So let's do that. And um, where's another problem that we need to address? If I were to use this now, everything underneath this filter will be affected. So if I make this darker, then the whole image will be will be less exposed or more exposed. So that's not really what I want. I only want this to act on the crab and not the rest of the image or the rest of my layer stack here. And again, there is a trick that is very unintuitive and, and not exactly documented as such. Uh, but if you hover in between the space between the crab and your filter layer here while holding the Alt or Option key, then this little icon comes up here. It's a square with a black arrow. And that means this will create a clipping layer or a clipping mask in between them. If you hold this and then left click with your mouse, then this thing will be indented. And that means this filter layer is only going to work on the layer directly underneath it. To get rid of it, uh, same thing, Alt, um, click on this, and then this icon will be will be there again with the crossed out arrow. And if you click it, then it will be indented uh, to the very left again. So again, if we apply that, and now we take down our exposure, then you can see it only works on the crab. It doesn't work on the rest of the picture. And that's exactly what I want. Again, not too much, just a little bit less so that the crab is kind of, you know, appears as if he had been running around there on that day on which I had taken the picture. This again is completely non-destructive, so you can do that. You can, you can change your mind later. I'll leave it here for now. And while we're here talking about all these things that we can do with Photoshop to make the final render or the composed uh, render look a little bit better, and um, here's another trick that is probably going to work better with a character if the character fills the whole picture here, and that is by vignetting parts of the picture to just very subtly highlight a part of the picture. I will show you this with the crab. Uh, by cr I create a new layer with this little um, square icon here. Or just head over to the layer menu, layer, new, new layer. That'll do the same thing. It'll be a layer on top of everything. In fact, to make this a little bit easier on the eye, I'm just going to collapse uh, all these things. So I'm going to shift select all my layers and hit command or control G to group them. So they're all still there. They're just, you know, neat and tidy in this group. So I'll select my layer and I'm going to head over to my marquee tool here, my, my circular marquee tool, or elliptical marquee tool as it's called. If you're seeing a rectangle here or one of these little rows, then just left click on this to bring up this context menu and select the elliptical marquee tool. And then we'll draw a circle around our crab. 
Not sure if you can see that in the screencast here. This is a this is a or an ellipse that's being drawn around the character. If you want to move this without changing its size, hit the space bar. And I'm just gonna draw a circle around my crab here. And as soon as you let go, the selection is active. I don't really want my my inside to be selected, I want everything else to be selected. So head over to select inverse. That will invert the selection, so now everything is um, selected, but not what's on the inside of the circle. That's kind of what I want. And with my Paint Bucket tool now, which is hiding underneath my Gradient tool, you can left-click and hold on this to bring that menu up. Select the Paint Bucket tool and um, flood fill everything in black, except for the crab. Deselect stuff with Command D or with Select. Whoops, Select Deselect. And again, we're going to convert this into a smart object. So layer, smart objects, convert to smart object. Now we have that little icon again. And I'm going to blur this a lot again with the filter. Filter, blur, Gaussian blur will do the trick. Uh, 2.5 is way too little uh, for this. So perhaps I'll try 50, or 60 even. Yeah, 60 is nice. So something, something really um soft you can even go higher than that I'll, I'll use 60 for now and uh that's not really the picture we're looking for we can't see the background it's all black but um we can knock down the opacity here to about something like 10 15 percent and what that does is it will kind of subtly highlight the crab in our picture it's it's only very subtle so if you click that that eyeball icon on the layer you can see what the effect is that it has so it's it's very very subtle it's almost non-noticeable depending on how much of a vignette you give it this is now looking as if the crab has a little spotlight applied to him so that may be a bit much but it, it certainly draws the viewers attention onto the crab and this works much better if your character is much larger and fills most of the picture and you can you can uh, subtly blur the rest of the picture out so perhaps you know 37 percent of my case is a bit much i'll just go with perhaps 15 or something there that's just a, a tiny bit of a an attention grabber that just you know subconsciously sucks the viewer's attention onto the crab all these values are non-destructive, so everything that we've made here, including the blur and the gradient and everything, you can you can change everything at a later date. If it makes your renders better, great. Uh, play around with it, uh, see what you can come up with, make it as subtle or as over the top as you like. Try it out with larger characters, try it out with different images, and uh, see if you can make your renders, you know, that tad better would be nice. Um, that was it. I hope it was helpful. If you like this video, please uh, share this with friends, family and total strangers. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Uh, bye for now. I will see you next time.